Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Arsenal Cannon Podcast Extravaganza, um, featuring myself, as always, Alfie Colshaw. Unfortunately, Mac and Danny, they couldn't hack it, they couldn't face it, because it is the night after the devastating defeat to Newcastle. We're all pretty gutted. Mac and Danny, they couldn't firm it. So instead, I am joined by the man with a versatile name, Rob, um, Robert, uh, Bobby. I'm not going to put in the random name because that's that's not what I do. That's Danny's thing. But what are you saying, Rob? Uh, a lot of sad words, as I said when I uh, got on call with you. It's uh, it's a really depressing day to be a gooner. Um, you know, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of it. But um, yeah, just objectively very sad. And um, that was communicated last night through, you know, all the means Twitter. I was rambling on about anything and everything and the group chat with all the writers was sort of popping off and um yeah it, it's a very somber mood today uh but i think it's good that we've left it um a good night's sleep to let us reflect on things and i hope that we can reflect on what as you made sure to point out last night was still a very good season for arsenal mm. Yeah, I was I was very riled up last night, and we'll get into that. This is episode 122, 122, I should say. Um, if you're listening on Spotify, great. Please leave us a review or like. I, I think we should say this at the start instead of the end, because, you know, it gets people to do it whilst they're listening to the show, you know what I mean? Leave a, leave a like and that if you're on Spotify or a review or whatever. And we are, of course, using Zencaster for the second time in a row. Me and Mac did it um, after the Spurs game. And unfortunately, there were some problems with exporting on our uh, editing software. So just, we couldn't get it out onto YouTube. Uh, but hopefully this is on YouTube. Hopefully you're watching us and you're seeing us uh, in all our glory. Um, and yeah, if you are, then, you know, subscribe and that and, and leave a like and, and all that sh- shit, you know, comment. Because um, we will have more of these. We will have more podcasts, obviously, and we'll have more videos hopefully over the summer about transfers and stuff which could be looking very different after last night um it was gutting like i think of results baku um the atletico madrid second leg 2011 um league cup final the villarreal game this for me is up there with them this is so i was absolutely gutted I was like genuinely just distraught at full time because we are so close to pulling off something which would have been a great achievement um and you know it's still possible but it's extremely unlikely Rob how are you, how I know you sort of summed it up very briefly when I introduced you but how are you feeling after last night yeah um, I mean it, it all feels eerily similar to those those games that you you sort of touched upon and even though I think um, we can sit back and accept that it sort of is different. The squad is clearly a work in progress. It's not the sort of Emery jobs where, you know, he'd he'd bring in a few big names or pull off a few emergency signings and think, okay, this might get us to where we want to get back. Clearly there is a long-term plan and we're we're, we're still on an upward trajectory. If you know what I mean, We're, we're, we're going to, hopefully continue pushing on and um that's that makes this summer and all the other transfer windows all the more crucial i think um this this wasn't a squad really assembled or designed might be the better word to really push for champions league qualification i think such a squad needs better depth which i think we'll definitely go into as as the show moves forward um but yeah it of course it's sad because it was it was in our hands um and although, as you say, it's not over, you know, it's 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 it feels in, incredibly unlikely that Spurs are going to slip up at Carrow Road at the weekend. Um, and when you go through from a position where you're literally a win away or even realistically a draw away, because I can't see us losing at home on the final day. I, I just think a win is inevitable still. Um, it, it, it's it's excruciating. Uh, and. I think everyone at the club has learned a lot about what you need to qualify for the Champions League because I think at the end of the day, we have just fall, fell short and that's for a, a plethora of reasons. But I think, uh, as I touched upon, depth is is right at the top of that list. 
Yeah, I think there's been a reoccurring theme this season with our defeats, um, which is something they pointed out actually on Arscast um, a few days ago. They seem to come in bursts this season anyway. Think of the three games at the start of the season. You think of United and Everton, dreadful performances. You think of the three games not too long ago, um, maybe even the games in in, um, April where we didn't score a goal, I don't think, or we scored, sorry, not April, January, um, when Saka scored against City, but then we had a a run of, you know, it wasn't too many games, but there. And then the three, um, obviously the three very notorious ones against uh, Palace, uh, Brighton and Southampton. And I do think so. there's something uh, I, anyone who listens to this podcast knows I am someone who doesn't like soft factor analysis very often. I'm very much, I want to look into the tactical things. I think soft factor analysis can be very lazy at times, you know, passion, desire. They didn't want it. Like players want to win games. Like it's very rare that players won't try. I think, I think we'll get into tactical stuff and there's obviously an element of that about last night. I think soft factors come into play um, and they come into play when, when we have lost a game um, in the next game. I think this, I know we go and talk about the inexperience of this team and I think that plays a role when we've lost a game, we are a bit panicky in the next game. And I do think, yeah, soft factor analysis was, soft factors were at play last night. I'm not talking about like desire of the team i don't think there was there's any application issues i think they almost they wanted it too much um they're almost like you could see nerves it was palpable and granite shaka said in his post-match interview the players didn't stick to the t- to the game plan they didn't stick to the tactical game plan that arteta had asked of them they didn't uh, play out their instructions I think that was quite obvious Arteta would have come with a game plan he would have had instructions for his players and last night I mean we'll get into that but it, they they seemed panicked and very nervy and they just didn't they probably didn't do a lot of what Arteta wanted them to do um, did you feel would, would you say soft factors were at play yesterday or do you think was, there's was more tactical stuff I think the um when you're analysing it as a, a match of football, um, as as Shaka said, of course, there were things that Arteta definitely would have wanted from the players, which the players didn't deliver. But I think uh, the soft factors are inextricably um, sort of linked to that. It, um, you know, you, you think of, of bravery on the night. Um, and that is something which is essential when, you, when you're playing a team who presses high. And that's what... What Newcastle did last night. They gave us no time on the ball. And, you know, we didn't have the bravery to try and play through that. And that would have been the way to to create chances by 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 bypassing the Newcastle press and getting at a, you know, quite a slow defense, perhaps in transition as well. Um, that would have been the way to go about beating Newcastle. And I'm I'm sure that was the plan. Um, but you you see players, um, I think last night. Aaron Ramsdale was emblematic of this. He he's usually so calm on the ball. Um, well, perhaps not so much lately, but definitely at the start of the season. And you know, he just was consistently going long when he has been so sort of essential in the way that we've scored our goals. Um, sort of building up from the back and even sp- spraying a pass into midfield or just having the confidence to give a player who has pressure on him the ball. Um, and that, that ties into the nerves. Um, it felt like nobody wanted the ball. And um, yeah, that, that that really did end up hurting us. And I think that is almost exclusively down to the soft factors at play. These these guys knew what was on the line. And unfortunately, they, they did succumb to the pressure last night. Yeah, yeah. Um... That was evident from the start. I think there were so many examples of players being rushed in possession. I think what were the possession stats at half time? It was something in like 70 30, uh, which is unheard of for an Arteta team. You know, normally we're synonymous with control, the way we control games. We like to control possession, control territory, non existent in this game. Newcastle 
really asserted themselves. I don't think they created too much in the first half, but they really asserted themselves with that press, as you mentioned. Um, and obviously the press, uh, what frustrated me was that it was a fucking Newcastle. Like it wasn't Liverpool. It wasn't Liverpool's press. This was a Newcastle press, which was very, like it was, it was a good, decent press, but it was, you could play through that quite easily if you had a bit more composure, but we, we just struggled to compose ourselves at any point. And I think it was the magnitude of the, the situation that got to certain players. Um, on the team, obviously there were some doubts before kickoff. Ben White and Gabriel both started. I think it's fair to say neither looked completely fit. Arteta clearly deemed the risk of playing them, uh, the, the the risk of it, the, the reward that we could potentially get from it um, being worth the risk. What do you make of that decision and generally the, the team selection? Would you maybe look to vary it after having a game just a few days ago? You, you know, the, the problem is that, um, of course, if we, if we had the adequate depth, of course, you wouldn't want to start a half-fit <coughs> centre-back pairing. But we, we didn't have that depth. And I think um, we, we, we're talking a lot about soft factors, but I think the team as a whole feels more confident when they've got Ben White and Gabriel there. Uh, they're two big figures. Um, they, especially Ben White, he epitomizes what, what Arteta sort of wants from a player in the sort of defensive third on the ball. Um, he adds that calmness. And I thought Ben White was the better defender out, out of the four on the night. I thought he had some, some decent moments. I thought, you know, very unlucky to concede that own goal. Um, he didn't deserve that. Uh, and especially given how little football he's been playing lately, he, he did really well to come back in and um, deliver a good showing. Um, but yeah, the, the, the fitness issues were, were blatant. You know, we talk about Ben White and Gabriel, but of course, Tommy Asu went off again. He, he's he been out for a long time. We're sort of looking at him as the guy, oh, oh he's definitely going to start, but we forget that he's probably not even anywhere near 100% fit I yet. thought he looked... Um, he didn't look fit. Like, no, we, very I shaky. This We talk about how consistent he's been. He has been excellent. A few games where he hasn't. Brighton away, I think, he struggled. Mm, mm. Um, I think... Uh, Liverpool, when he just came back, when he was clearly basically injured uh, in that League Cup game. And then this, I think every other game, he's pretty much been exceptional. Yeah. Um, but those three, I think Sir Maximan was, had the better of him and he just didn't yeah, fit did. for me. Yeah, yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. And then on the left, you've got Nuno, who for all the good that he offers going forward, and I thought he did have bright moments. I thought perhaps bringing him off was the wrong decision. I thought he was sort of striking up quite a nice little partnership with Martinelli down the left, which was offering us a glimmer of hope. Uh, and then he was withdrawn. And this is a guy who, unfortunately, <laughs> the soft factors, again, you have to bring them up because you look at him at the start of the season. And I know that you've talked about this a lot, Alfie. He's, he's not a bad player. I don't know why all of a sudden it's like, Ah, uh, he's he's the worst thing to touch the grass at the Emirates. He he's really not. At the start of the season, he was harshly displaced by Kieran Tierney, um, and a lot of people were suggesting he shouldn't have been. Uh, he's not a bad player, but he's he's suffering with with that lack of confidence. Um, and when you know, just days before, you're not trusted in the team's biggest game of the season. The what whatever you want to call it some people have been calling it the biggest game of the last five years it it was that big and he wasn't trusted in that game instead of finished fellow portuguese on the opposite flank was was given the chance to play in that game and you know that 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 knocks anyone's confidence um, don't get me started on cedric <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did i didn't even want to say his name um you know if, i'm not sure how much worth there is in going into the goals but of course he was responsible for that third goal with his awful sorry the second goal with that awful positioning um so yeah it was a defense which you know every single player on that back line had problems going into the game whether psychologically or physically uh and that's bound to 
to play its part and when you're you're in a possession based system where playing out the back is is so essential you need guys who are full of confidence and that just wasn't the case last night unfortunately yeah see my thoughts before the game on how we should approach it were as you just said there we had so many problems at the back with the players who clearly weren't fit and Luno's lack of confidence, Ramsdale suffering from a bit of a lack of confidence at the moment and just his erraticism. I think what like what would have made sense in our approach was to really play on the front foot and emphasise our attack because our attack was largely unhindered from what it has been. Um, perhaps he should have mixed it up. I mean, I know he brought Smith Rowe in. Maybe Martinelli would have been the better choice um, from the start. But I just think we should have we should have really got at them from early and 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 taken the game to them. Instead, it was it felt like a more cautious approach. But then again, I don't know if that's. I think maybe Arteta was looking for that, and he just didn't get it from his players. Which maybe you have to point to Arteta in his biggest game of the season. His players are so so nervous that they completely throw all the instructions out the pram. Um, you know, I I was confused as to what, what we were trying to do. And at half time, I think I said it on the chat, I couldn't tell whether that was like actually an all right half that was slightly instructed, probably not as, as well as Arteta wanted, but he was sort of like contain Newcastle and then in the second half we'll push on. Um, because Newcastle, let's face it, they had possession, but they didn't create anything in the first half. Thing. So Maximan had that shot, which Ramsdale saved. We were largely relatively comfortable defensively. They had a lot of offside. It was going forward. We did absolutely nothing. Um, I can think of a Saka uh, interchange with Odegaard where he had a shot blocked. That was about it. Um, yeah. The, what, what do you think of the first half performance in general? And do you think that was what Arteta had been looking for? Yeah, it just it just looked like a performance that um, was was very much averse to, to what we needed. We we had to win the game, uh, and I know there still needs to be an element of cautiousness because if you get caught on the break or whatever, and you go one nil down, then it's then it's really tough, especially for an Arsenal side who don't do well when they go down, uh, go down a goal. Uh, you know our record record when we. And we're losing. We we don't tend to turn games around, but at the same time, if you're sitting back, you're, you're just as likely, I think, to concede because you're giving your opponent so much confidence. And I know that there's always the chance of going down the other end. You you spoke about that interplay between Erdegaard and Saka. Perhaps we just were relying on that moment of brilliance, but. <sighs> We're not that team. We don't have a Harry Kane or a Hyungman Son who's going to give us that that one moment of magic to to flip the game. We're not quite. We don't have that caliber of player quite yet. And don't get me wrong, the likes of Bukayo Saka, Martinelli, Smith Rowe, etc. They they can all get to that level, but that's not them at the moment. We're not we're not good enough to to think. Okay, that man is going to score us that goal today. That is going to give us that win. We we, we can't depend on them to do that yet. Um, so. It, it it was a it was poor and I think I would be very surprised if that was Arteta's plan to go into it cautiously. Uh, I think we play our best football when when we do really go for teams on the front foot. Of course we do. It's a that's how good teams win games. Um, and it cost us that we sort of were more um, more cautious. And yeah, I think uh, we. We go up that level when we we don't play with that fear. But for a young side, it's it's very very difficult to to do that when when the pressure is on. And I I completely also understand the performance and why the players perhaps were playing with with that handbrake on. Yeah, yeah, and I just think that first half was. I, th- I was more frustrated with the second half performance, to be honest, because I thought first half, not great. We haven't got a foothold. Um, we have put no sort of, I don't think we had a period where we were on top, any period where we sort of asserted any sort of territorial control, possession, even if not creating chances. We didn't have a single, per- I think we had, I'd be interested to see what our like, longest passing um, sort of 
chain was in that first half like how many passes we managed in a row before losing the ball because it didn't feel like we managed any yeah it um, felt like the Newcastle turnovers were every second it felt like as soon as we got the ball it, it was soon to be gone again and said this at half time we, we were just losing every second ball and, and that's that's when the frustration becomes in because that's when you feel like the effort isn't there and I think that still is linked to the fear but God, it, it's the most frustrating thing for a football fan. And, and that's, for me, why it felt so eerily similar to those defeats we, we've had in the past, which have sort of been so so excruciatingly painful. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, because it's that lack of effort, the lack of application, which, which really makes you so unbelievably frustrated as a football fan. But I don't think it was lack of effort. No, I'm not sure in, that's the word. The word, yeah, yeah. I yeah, think not it, in this it, game. Maybe I in think the it's past. more. Yeah, it just came. I think it came across that way because because of the of the fear. It wasn't because they didn't want it. It's because they were that nervous. I think. Yeah, I think they were. I think they were too nervous, and it was um, it was evident in the way they just yeah threw out the clear instructions that Arteta probably gave to them, um, and that is about decision making on the ball for players they need to go into games and it the, the managers can tell them what they want them to do but at the end of the day the players have to execute it and if they can't execute it I, I don't know where the, the buck lies I mean they have executed for a large map part of the season but at crucial points they haven't been able to do that um and I guess yeah second half was more frustrating it was Basically more of the same, but more rampant from Newcastle. I thought Newcastle took it up a gear and we just, we had absolutely, no, the only thing I can remember us doing in the whole half going forward was a couple of terrible uh, skied shots from Pepe and Saka. One opportunity for Saka where it sort of opened up for him, but it took a massive deflection, went over and then the chance for Odegaard inside the box where it got blocked. Those are the only moments and none of them were great quality moments. Um, and they all sort of came, before we enter the goals, they all sort of came, well, basically none of them did, apart from the Odegaard chance. They came before we made the sort of rushed subs. Um, what do you make of, the, make of the substitutions? Because I think Tim Stillman pointed out on Twitter I thought he got them wrong. I thought he made us too ragged too early. It was a sign of desperation, some of those subs. Bringing Nuno off. Nuno was starting to to uh, combine well with Martinelli. He was starting to get into some good positions. He brought him off because he was clearly the player he trusted the least on the pitch, which I think was the wrong decision. He did the sort of typical Arsene Wenger thing when you're chasing a game, just bring on as many attacking players as possible and see what happens. Um, and it didn't work. What, what did you make of, the, of the, the four subs that we had? Yeah, I think um, it it sort of left us in a position where the players' nervousness would have just been exacerbated further um, by by that that desperation in the substitutions. You know, I think at, at the end of the game we had. Pepe on the right. We had Saka playing in a deeper role. We had Martinelli sort of as a wing back. Um, we had Lacazette and Eddie up top. You know, we never play with a front two. Um, you know, by the end of the game, we just had a horrendous back three of Cedric White and Granite Xhaka. Um, and they, you're right. They just they just slap of desperation, and I'm not sure how much that that does for the players um, on the pitch. I think I I get that things were really going south, but when the players already feel that nervous, and then they, they can see that the the manager doesn't have the confidence in them to sort of turn things around through these substitutions, it, it does nothing for you and. I understand why Arteta made the substitutions too. I think you pointed out in the chat, so what what else would would he do in that situation? Um, but, but I do. I said that about you know. I understood why he might bring on Pepe and Lacazette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, goal for it. But it, but of I've course, come, bringing Nuno off was was strange to me. It yeah, was, yeah. It, it was it it was it was weird. Um, and 
I think um, Daniel mentioned in the, in the chat that a manager like Ancelotti w- would never do that um, because he's he's a he's a wise old man. He's been in the game long enough to know that if you tear up a structure, then then usually things don't go well. Um, and at the, at the same time, like they can, it can go. Like we look at the Wolves course, game early in the season, yeah. where where we sort of sort of did the same thing. We just threw on attacking players. I think we bought a fullback off that night, maybe Cedric. Yeah, yeah, and it worked in the end. It did work. It did, and it and it can. You're right. Um, but in a game of this magnitude, it it just does send all the wrong messages, unfortunately. Uh, and I think that's you know that's something that Mikel Arteta will, will learn as his career progresses. I also think it's something we'll do more infrequently as as we improve the caliber of player in our squad because he will be able to sort of have more trust in his structure and to know that his team, regardless of who's on the pitch, will be able to apply that pressure. Unfortunately, he doesn't trust the likes of Cedric and Tavares under, understandably to to form that, um, to be able to mount that pressure on our team. I think if he had his starting eleven, he would have changed very little and trusted to trusted his team to eventually sort things out and break Newcastle down. But um, yeah, it was it was it was just emblematic of the desperation on the night and. Uh, you know, it was just a very sorry affair by the time that the final whistle blew. Um, so, yeah, really, really sad, but a learning curve for absolutely everyone at the football club, I think. Yeah, should we um, should we get into the goals briefly? Um, yeah, yeah. The first goal, um, I can't even remember. When, when we lose games and we concede, Goals, well, obviously, if we're losing, we've conceded goal, but I just sort of forget about the build-up towards goals. I can't remember what happened the first goal. All I remember yeah. is that... Um, who put the cross in? Uh, was it Maximan, or was it... Might have been tar- yeah, it might have been Target. target. It, was, it was one of their left sides. Whoever it was, players, yeah. somehow they've got in. Somehow Cedric has pushed way up, which is what Cedric yeah. likes to do. He likes to push up to defend because he likes... Clive said this on Ask the Original. He likes to defend by not being there, if you know what I mean. He likes <laughs> to push up and try and win the ball high up. And then once it bypasses him, you know, what can he do? This, like, You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't know where the fuck Cedric is, um, but he's completely vacated his space. They get him behind. Uh, it's just really strange as well because I remember now it, it comes from... Um a switch in play as well because it comes from the Nuno foul throw which you know probably wasn't a foul throw when you actually look at it but who cares about talking about refs at this point um it, it comes from that switch and surely when the ball switches you, you drop back into your position I mean maybe you push up high to try and win it back but as the fact it was sort of a backward switch as well it it was a ball from long stuff I think which went way off and sort of drop back to target back there out of memory. And at that point, Cedric is getting nowhere near it when it's that deep in the half and he feels the need to go and press high. Um, and then after that, I think it is just really unfortunate on Ben White's part. I think Callum Wilson did have an excellent game in fairness to him. He caused our unfit centre-backs all sorts of issues. Um, if only it was Chris Wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it was a shame that Wilson had to be back on the night. Um, but yeah, it, it's just Cedric and, um, we all know that he has to go in the summer and I'm sure he will. I hope so. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good cross, um, from whoever, I think it might've been target. I sort of, when he got through on that left-hand side, I was like, this is going to be a goal. Like, I can't see how White or Gabrielle are going to be able to cover around on this. And as soon as the cross came in, I was like, White's going to reach for this. And he did. And there wasn't a lot he could do. And he diverts into his own goal. Depressing. And as soon as that went in, I, I'm I'm not going to lie. I had very, very little hope of us turning it around. We've seen all these stats about us. We, ha- we don't go behind that frequently. But when we do, we have very, very rarely, apart from that Wolves game, there's probably a few others. We've very, very rarely turned it around. Um, and there was no response. Um, 
and then they eventually got the second, which is more of a mess for me. Talk to me about the second goal because you said <laughs> yes, <laughs> Cedric again. Here we are. Um, you know, it's a it's a really nice little uh, sort of dink ball through. I can't remember who played it, and then um, Callum Wilson gets on the end of it, gets a bit unlucky. Uh, good save from Ramsdale, I thought, closed him down really well, and then the ball falls for um, falls for Bruno, which was quite uh, poetic. Um, and then, yeah, but scored yeah. against the team that never wanted him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, but it it sort of does make you reflect on that January window a lot. You know, if we had a player like him in our midfield last night, it would have been a very different story. He even played as, as we that. We will get six. into that. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, he sort of played as that number six, even last night. And it makes you think, God, imagine if we had him to come in instead of El Nenny, a uh, player who's so confident on the ball, who's willing to bypass a press on his own, even if it's not a hundred percent success. Um, and a player who just was caused us problems all night. I thought he was bloody excellent, uh, which was really, really annoying. Um, and then, yeah, good good finish from him, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, it all came from that first phase where Cedric was just so unbelievably deep. Um, not high for once. Um, and mind you, the way he plays, he could have easily been high. Um, it, it's just... Just Probably so, on cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> just um just so depressing to watch and sort of a goal which I think um was um sort of it exemplified everything that's been wrong with with this with this squad in in in, in terms of when we when we've been down because it was caused by those players who just aren't good enough. Um, you know, We'll go into other performances, I'd imagine, but I think El Nenny had some role in the in the goal, and he was just so negative last night. Um, you know, I think if we had Partey, it's a completely different story because he is that player who can navigate that press so well, and then find players like Martin Odegaard, um, who was quite absent last night. Unfortunately, uh, I think I think it was Clive again on Twitter who put that the team ticks when. Odegaard is purring and when he doesn't purr it's uh it's a very different story um but yeah it was a it was a really heartbreaking goal but I think the game was already done at that point so it was really just a dagger in our hearts well you mentioned El Nenny there and we've spoken about Cedric and his role in the two goals and I thought he was just pretty terrible throughout mm. the game um yeah um El Nenny I thought was very poor yesterday. Weirdly, um, Scott, oh, that crab who does the data div, uh, visualizations on Twitter, he showed that El Nenny, he was quite surprised himself because he put El Nenny question mark, uh, led the game or led our side of the game for progressive passes, which is surprising because it did not feel like that. And maybe like he had quite a few opportunities to play those progressive passes and a, a small percentage of them. Um, came off and then other players didn't quite get that time because they didn't press El Nenny as much as they pressed players who they knew had more ability to progress the ball. I think that's how you could justify that. But I thought he was... <sighs> I've said for weeks now, and he, he, we all knew he was a very limited player. I said, okay, yeah, he's come in for a few of the big games. He's very good at Chelsea, very good at United against United. But I said... You know, we've seen him come in and, and, you know, bring a bit of a composure, a bit more defensive stability in front of that back four on in big games previously. It's then, does he, is he able to follow it up? And no, he's not. He's, he's so limited. And this was just a reminder of that. And I would not be extending him without doubt. Um, I thought it was a problem last night with our inability to play through that press because he's so so cautious on the ball um and if he just you know if he'd done if I'd, i'm not expecting him to be thomas party but if he can sort of step away from someone closing him down just slightly like maybe we're able to beat the press but he was a big part of why we couldn't absolutely i, I think you've hit the nail on the head i think as we 
are fully aware based on the reaction to last night's game football fans are incredibly short-sighted so when a player has a good game people think oh yeah he can stick around for a few more years uh i think it's more worrying that the likes of david ornstein have been suggesting that the even the club have been entertaining uh the idea of extending him up I, I get that you know he might never play but he probably will end up playing just as he has done this season um because we have needed him and as you said he's been very good on occasion but his limitations have been evident at Arsenal from the day he signed for the club um so I think when you grow dependent on that sort of player eventually their their limitations are become, going to become very obvious you know you mentioned the fact Newcastle didn't press him very much um that undoubtedly would have been part of their game plan they recognized that he, he he's a weakness and when it's funny how sometimes when a player is given more time to sort of do things how their their weaknesses are exposed even more um and how teams sort of try to um emphasize those weaknesses yeah no way he should get a new contract unfortunately uh his time is done uh we need a better player who can cover at number six. As you touched upon, we'll, we'll talk about January. That player should have been signed in January. Um, we know Thomas Partey's injury record. It's not very good at Arsenal. Uh, we know Kieran Tierney's injury record. It's not very good at Arsenal. Uh, and now we know Takahiro Tomiyasu's injury record at Arsenal. It's not very good. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's all about just getting better quality and depth. Uh, and last night was... Uh, the perfect exemplification of that. Yeah, and full time game ends. Um, we 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 didn't show any sign of getting back into it. Um, and yeah, the game ends pretty devastating. Um, some harsh words said in Granite Shackers. Actually, yeah, what did you think of Granite Shackers interview after the game? Because it's been a lot of debate about that. Yeah. If, if people didn't see it, he basically said the players, like certain players, or if you're not up for this game, you shouldn't be here or um, the players didn't carry out the manager's instructions, stuff like that. I'm going to link back to what um, James said on the last Ask Cast. He, he talked about emotion. We, we always forget when we're analysing press conferences that emotion is right at the top of, of these players' agenda when they're, when they're talking after a football match. The amount of adrenaline that you exert during a, a football match, it's all still there at the end of the game. And, and that was evident in Shaka's interview. But I also think he hit the nail on the head. Um, if there were players who, who played with too much fear uh, last night and if... You're going to turn up and play with that fear. Don't don't bother playing at all. Uh, and I know that that fear is there for the right reasons. Um, but it, it really did hurt us last night. And, you know, I, I don't want to talk about him too much because he's just been an absolute bloody idiot lately, as per usual. But what Gary Neville said about it, about, oh, I hope that he's not speaking to the kids that way. Who cares if he is? These players need to hear the message from time to time that performing like that isn't good enough. I, I know they already know that. But Granite Shaka is our leader, whether we like it or not. And if anyone's going to say it to them, it's him. Uh, and I think that if we're going to progress as a team, those those words alongside you know the obvious lesson of the fact we've missed out on top four, these words need to be said. These players need to be told off from time to time. Um, and I, I thought it was an excellent interview if if i'm being honest maybe he could have said things a little bit differently but emotion certainly sort of um impacted the way he spoke and i thought he spoke for the fans it's how i would have spoken after the game if i was uh in that that dressing room and that's also i, I people are saying oh look at the number of times he sort of effed up as an arsenal player like, well, i even thought he was one of our better players he was one of the only players who was looking to move forward with the ball at his feet despite his physical limitations. And if he wasn't here in the last few weeks, we would be nowhere near this. We wouldn't even be talking about this. You look at the Chelsea game and the Man United game, he was bloody excellent. So I, I just think 
he, I think he had every right to speak the way he did, and I'm glad he did speak that way because I, I would prefer the player to speak candidly than talk about the the usual rubbish of oh, on another day this could have happened and that. I thought it was a really good interview for me. Yeah, I agree, and I'd I'd second what you said there about having to take. You can't, you can't quite take these, you know, very post-match interviews, um, very immediate post-match interviews um, at face value. You can't really um, because they are just so emotional. And, you know, if you think of what Arteta said um, after that Spurs game, that was very emotional and that was probably more PR. It was more message to his players to sort of, uh, you know, create this siege mentality, which obviously didn't work in the end, but that was probably what he was trying to do in that interview. Let's get away from the game because it was, it was tragic. Um, we've di- we've delved into it enough. Let's talk more about the general failure and the general season and what we're looking at now. I think I, this is what I said to Mac the other day on the podcast, on the last podcast. We have been punching above our weight in recent weeks, uh, or probably since the Palace game when our t- some of our best players got injured and we've been forced to rely on squad players, the likes of Eddie and Ketia, Rob Holding, Cedric, Tavares, El Neni. And Arteta, for, you know, four, five games, he managed to get more out of them than most coaches could um, and it it just ended up being a step too far, I think, in the last two games. I think we just saw their limitations and saw that ultimately they're not good enough. Um, and ultimately we haven't been good enough this season. That is, that is, we are just slightly below spur. Maybe we have, we have a better team uh, or we are a better team in terms of our tactical setup. You know, tactically, um, we play better uh, with the players we have, but we don't have the elite players that they have. We don't have Harry Kane. We don't have Son who can, you know, the goal threat they bring. We don't have sufficient goal threat in this team. We don't have the quality that they have in certain key positions um, that have ultimately carried them through. And they they also have a world-class, very experienced manager, which is something we don't necessarily have at this point. Definitely not very experienced. Um, ultimately, I just don't think we had enough. Um, and it's very painful to say, but maybe it's too early. Maybe we aren't ready to get into the top four, but we'll be clearly on. Um, and what makes it so infuriating is not the fact that it's, I think it's a disgrace we haven't made the top four. We're not going to. Um, it's more the fact that it was we were so close to pulling off something before we were meant to before it was like before where we expected when we were expected to get into the top four um, and we've just missed out. That's what makes it so agonizing. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I would, I would completely second that. It's, it, I was tweeting this last night. It, it just isn't a squad that's designed to qualify for the champions league. Um, a squad that's designed. And to people, qualify. people will say yeah. that we should, we should be at that level, but You've got to think about it more holistically as a project, yeah. as a process. Yeah. I know that's not what people like to hear, but it's the reality of how far we've <laughs> fallen down that we have yeah. to build up in increments. You know, you can't just go straight back to the top unless you've got infinite resources, which we don't. Yeah. And we talk about depth, um, but that that sort of takes us back to last summer, really, when when really the, this, this squad was built. We signed as many players as we could if we're if we're if we're being honest um and it did a lot it it has taken us very very far further than as you've already touched upon a lot of us expected when we have let's go through the 11 ramsdale tommy asu white gabriel tierney parte Erdegaard, shaka saka even lacazette who was excellent during some parts of the season then and then martinelli or smith rowe that is a champions league team right there but when that level drops, we're nowhere near a Champions League team. We're, we're perhaps not even quite a Europa League team. Um, and that's because that's that's last season's team who finished eighth. Um, so let's let, let, we, we just need to remember that this is 
really where we are. We we're that team who have a really good starting eleven, but you can't have the same starting eleven every week. So therefore, it's going to be the case that you're likely going to finish around fifth or sixth. You're going to have some really good patches, and then you're going to have some really bad patches where you don't have that full eleven available to you. At the end. yeah, look, we could have got really lucky this season. We only played one game a, re- a week. Realistically, we could have got really really lucky and had our full eleven available for the whole season. But that's that's not really how football works. Um, and as such, our, our deficiencies have been really exposed where we where we haven't had that players and. Unfortunately, we do also have quite a few injury-prone players. Um, so I think when, you, when you're looking back at this season and how well the squad has done, considering the injury-prone pl- profiles we have, how we have adapted in certain games when we when we have been down pretty bad in, in terms of the players that we've been missing, we, we've done incredibly well at times and it only hurts so much because we got so close and because we it was right there for us to grab um and, and injuries have cost us yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah. you know this it would have been a very different story if thomas Partey didn't get injured i think he's he's the main one um i think if Tim, i think even tommy asu if you don't have yeah. him you, if you're not yeah. without him for two and a half months, then mm. we're in a better position. You know, yeah. Tierney. Like, it, I, I, Tim Stillman tweeted it. I'm referencing him again. He, like, we would have. I think we would have made the top four if we'd had our fully fit eleven. But I think know, it would have been done a few weeks ago because I, I think so. Yeah. yeah, but if we we don't lose against Southampton in that game, if we have Thomas Partey sitting in in the six and Tommy Asu and Tierney are left and right, we we just don't lose that game. It, it doesn't happen. I remember the the prediction podcast that you did with Daniel. You were speaking in that game, expecting us to have the players available to us, which um, you know have taken us as far as we've come. Um, you. You spoke about the fact you expected us to win every home game, which I think to a large extent we have done other than than Brighton because we are just so good at home. And that's another game that we don't lose if we've got our full set of players available to us. It, it's just these factors which have forced us to pull up lame. But at the same time, that is the reality of this squad. And... Next season, when hopefully we have cleared out those players who aren't quite good enough, upgraded them, made sure that when we do lose a few key players, our level can stay relatively high. That that should be the objective. It's a totally different story, and inevitably they're going to learn. The the club are going to learn from that, and who knows? Maybe being in the Europa League could be really, really good for this squad in in learning how to cope with two games a week again in learning how we can adapt when when we're missing a few key players. It it could be a really, really valuable season for us and that gradual return might be for the best. Yeah, as you said there, it's the, it's the reality of the squad. We didn't have the requisite quality in our depth um, when we needed it. And I think it's, it's easy to criticise that. If you go back to last summer, you could say, or you could say we could have kept some of the stronger squad players that we let go. Um, the likes of Maitland Niles and Chambers in the summer. I'd much rather have seen either of them at right back than Cedric in recent months. Um, but I do think looking at it before the season, I think everyone said we needed to trim down the squad um, because we, as you said, we only have one game a season. You can't say to certain players, and I think the squad was even too big in the first half of the season, um, you can't say to certain players, you know, you're going to play a handful of League Cup minutes. Um, and unless there's injuries, you're probably not going to play in the Premier League. That's a very th- hard thing to say to any player. And most players who are good, properly good, are not going to want that role. So they're going to want to leave. So I think there w- it was a, a tough balancing act. And I think that yeah, it's it's easier to say that in hindsight because um, I was somebody who said, "Yeah, I I support this um, slimming down of the squad." I do think, however, we'll get into January now. Maybe January was an opportunity, and I'm going to embarrass myself here. I wrote a piece when we had that break when we went to Dubai. 
we had 17 games left and I wrote a piece saying squad depth should not or will not cost Arsenal in the 17 cup finals remaining. And that has proved to be very wrong. Um, I mean, it clearly has. Um, What do you think we could have done in January? And for me, I'm not sure what it boils down because who would have said we needed a left back in January? I I don't think anyone, realistically. Yeah. Who would have said we need a right back? Possibly. But who would have said, I, I, I don't know. Like, And that's where it's cost us. Maybe we could have done with a midfielder. Yeah, talk to me about January. Yeah, I think um, a, a midfielder was certainly a player that um, everyone was, was, was sort of calling out for. Uh, but I think a lot, you're right. I think a lot of players... Arthur it, Mello would have been yeah, useful. He, he would, have, would have definitely been useful. Um, but... At the same time, I think a lot of people were also thinking, let's wait, let's wait till we can get that proper player that's going to fill that role that Shaka plays or even be quite uh, versatile in the way that maybe he can play the Shaka and Partey role. Um, you know, you look at Gimaresh last night, um, which is excruciating. Um, but at the uh, people understood it. People could sit back and think, okay, this is a really good starting eleven we've got here. Let's make sure we get that right player. But that's when, really, I think that the the technical director comes in, the one who's supposed to have that more more perspective, um, and he's supposed to think, okay, great, we have this amazing starting eleven. But if something goes wrong. It goes very wrong. Uh, our level drops significantly. And you're right, Arthur Arthur Mello would have been so helpful in recent weeks. And, and I know that the negotiation was, it wasn't easy with Juventus. They wanted certain things which we weren't willing to accept. But maybe in that moment where you really understand that this is a weak squad in terms of depth, you, you just do it because he, he would have been so, so helpful just in the in the roles that he would have been able to fill. Uh, Imagine we'd had him instead of El Nenny. In absolutely, yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. Um, I, and I, I also don't think it's that the club weren't willing to do business. We know the club were willing to spend £75 million on Dusan Vlahovic. We, we, we know that for a fact. Um, but that deal wasn't possible. Clearly, there's there's an emphasis in the club at the moment that you buy the right player for this squad who is not only going to suit it um, sort of in his playing style, but also psychologically, you know, there's been this massive emphasis on improving the culture. We need a player who's going to fit in with the culture. There's so many factors which come into it. Um, so at the time, we all understood. It's fine. We're going to leave it. But we needed that perspective from someone at the club. We needed that person to say, oh shit, what's going to happen if Tom- Thomas Partey gets injured? Oh shit, what if we need to depend on Cedric for the rest of the season? And, and you're right, left back, I don't really think we need to sort of think about it that way because I think in January, we all thought Nuno was was good enough to come back in because before the turn of the year, he was completely fine as cover and I know that I'm not going to sit here and pretend he's like a, an absolute brilliant player. You know, he's had some very dodgy moments, but we thought that he was okay. I think right back, central midfield, and striker. If we signed the three players for those positions, we would probably be sitting nice and comfortably in the top four, maybe up there with Chelsea. Um, but that's that's not the reality of our season story. Uh, we needed that person in January to have that perspective to think. Let's just bring in some cover just in case, some quality cover uh, in certain areas. But but we didn't. And who knows, perhaps in the long term, we'll think, thank God we didn't pull the trigger and buy someone who was going to sort of sit around on big wages, uh, who was going to cause disruption to this squad. But I think when you're sitting here now, it, it just seems so blatantly obvious that we should have should have just not even gambled, just just bought some players who would have given us comfort I think you're right about a central midfielder I think and I also agree with what you said about with um, sticking by the plan and, and not you know triggering um, 
not being triggered by or for example not triggering isaac's release clause or someone who we did who we weren't convinced was the right guy um at that time um and paying way over the odds for him i think that was the right thing to do i do think if there had been someone available um who we could have got maybe on loan up front who was an upgrade on lacazette or on ketia that could have been something we could have explored like a, sh- a short stop gap deal um yeah like a six month loan for example because you know I think when it boils down to it that we haven't had a yeah, so striker hard to good find enough. That. So hard to find. It is hard to find, but I think when it boils down to it, we haven't had a good enough striker in this period. Um, we haven't had the goals in our team. Um, and that is largely because we didn't have enough strike. And I remember we were linked to Alvaro Morata. I don't think there was ever, any, ever anything behind that, but that would have been... I know people don't like him, but I would have absolutely taken him. And I think that would have been a massive upgrade on what we had. Could have helped us. Um yeah, it's it's difficult to say in hindsight, but ultimately, ultimately the depth has cost us, um, and it is gutting. And we're probably in the Europa League next season, and that probably has adverse effects. Well, will have adverse effects on our finances, and it probably has adverse effects on the players we are targeting and the players we can attract. Um, will Gabriel Jesus still come now? Who knows? Um, yeah, devastated. Anything else you'd want to add on on general things and the top four and stuff? You're mute. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm still getting used to this new software. Um, I think it's important to remember that players will still definitely be attracted to Arsenal. Uh, I know a few of my friends were in sort of meltdown last night, like, oh, why would any player come to us? We're, we're, we're in a really, really sort of strong position here with with the project we're offering. It's not like joining Arsenal a few years ago anymore. We've got a young manager who has a clear vision of where he wants to take this team. There's evidence of the fact that this is a team who are capable of pushing for Champions League qualification. There is evidence of the fact that our starting eleven is one of the best in the league. Um, Players are going to want to still come to Arsenal. Whether we can get that highest calibre of player that has been talked about in recent weeks at this point, who knows? But we'll definitely be able to buy players. I think who... players like Paolo Dybala and yeah, um, Latoro Martinez, who've been linked with, I think they're very much off the table now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. But as we saw last summer, you don't need those big names. You need smart scouting. Tommy Asu, for example, is one of the best right backs in the league now, and we got him for a snip, eighteen million. The players are there. And if we can identify them, you know, players like Cody Gakpo have been talked about. This is a guy who no one knows very much about, but he could come in and be an absolute bloody superstar. On the other hand, he couldn't. He could be a a flop. You know, it's risky signing forwards from uh, the Eredivisie. Um, but I don't think it's it's a time to wallow and think oh, we're directionless and aimless now and no one's going to want to join us. A lot of players are going to be want to be involved with this project. And it's still an exciting time to be an Arsenal fan, I think. I completely agree with that. And on this channel, if you're watching it on YouTube, we will have content around transfers. We will have scouting videos of players, hopefully. Hopefully Rob will get in with this. I want to do a series about squad building where we go through each position and sort of go through the pos- the players we may yeah. need. That'd be great. Like that. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll do that. So yeah, if you, if you're interested in that, subscribe in that. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah. It's not over at this point. Yeah. Is it? It's not, it's, it's not. not over. Like <laughs> it would be, I know, I know we've sort of bottled it, bottled it in the last two games but mm. and actually I don't want that to be the narrative of this season by the way I don't want it to be Arsenal bottle top four I mean we have sort mm. somewhat choked it but you know Arsenal collapse weak Arsenal collapse at the last moment I want it to be this is an Arsenal side that made a lot of changes last summer has brought in a, have brought in a new squad that is very young very exciting has a lot of potential um, it's not 
the squad that we've seen in recent years, the old, same old players making the same old mistakes. It's new players who are make, doing a lot of good things, still making mistakes. Um, and they have had a great first season together as a squad, um, going well beyond where anyone expected them to and have made progress essentially to the team. And that's what the narrative should be. And with some quality additions um, in key areas and with another year of experience on top, next season there's no there's no reason why next season wouldn't be better so yeah i'm still optimistic for the future as much as i'm gutted that we've missed out on this brilliant opportunity to be back in the tournament the, the competition we want to be in again and yeah 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 i, I would completely second that obviously it's not over I, i'm not getting my hopes up obviously it's relegated norwich for god's sake but you know final day atmospheres at home and they're, they're, they're difficult to play at uh, I'm not saying Carrow Road is uh, any sort of cauldron, but uh, all hope is not gone. Uh, but I think wouldn't it be the most Spursy thing though? It, it definitely would. It would. Like it would be. <laughs> it would be like new levels of unreal. Like it would if they somehow get battered like three nil. Yeah, five and... one with a red card for Norwich. Yeah, yeah. shout Newcastle. Yeah, yeah. It, it would be that sort of um, capitulation which we could we could all foresee occurring for Spurs. But I'm it not going to the history my hopes. of the Tottenham. <laughs> yeah, um, these next few days, it's time to sort of come to terms with the fact. I think that we have missed out on it, and if somehow it does happen, of course, we're all going to be elated. Um, but I think it's time that we come to terms with what's happened. Hopefully we have a really good performance on the final day against Everton, get a, get a win, have some time where the players can, can be with be with the fans um, on the hopefully a really good atmosphere, even though we have just fallen short. And let's let's enjoy this these last few days and then this summer will be really important for <clears throat> a few players to reset psychologically because yeah, that erraticism has unfortunately cost us in a, in a few games towards. They need certain players need rests. They need yeah. long rests. Like yeah, give, it's quite annoying that there's um, international football and like I think England have four games. Like a lot of the teams in Europe have four games uh, in the in the Nations League, which is just mental. Um, but hopefully they get you know a good three four weeks completely off. Um, certain players really need it. I think they look fatigued. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And um, yeah, it's just, it's hugely disappointing, but life goes on. Arsenal will still be Arsenal. And hopefully next season we go from strength to strength. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's hope so. Um, and yeah, a few days left the season. We will hopefully bring you a podcast after the Everton game. And then hopefully we're going to do a four man end of season drunk cast. Cause we missed out on the end of 2021 drunk cast. So hopefully we'll bring you a, a, a end of 21, 22 season drunk cast with, with all four of us. Um, if you're fans of that. Um, and yeah, it will be much easier to do now because we've got this new, this new, uh, Zen caster, which you're all hopefully watching us on. Um, and yeah, so if you are watching us, then yeah, as I've said a number of times, subscribe. If you're just listening as as normal on Spotify, you know, leave leave a review in that. Or iTunes, iTunes doesn't exist apparently. Someone told me the other day. Um, yeah, you're on mute, but yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, but iTunes does not exist. Um, wow. and neither does neither does other. Yeah, SoundCloud, Apple Music, whatever you're listening to, you know, leave a review or a yeah, like, whatever yeah. the platform allows you to do. And yeah, um, Rob, marketing opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, I have very little for you, but I am planning to write for We Love You Arsenal this week. Haven't decided what on yet, but uh, that will be out on Thursday. So do wait for, uh, do have a read of that when it comes out. You. I'm going to shout out Max piece from last night. It is a bit depressing if you read it now um, because it was sort of, sort of preview thing for Newcastle. But it was a little like poem. Um, it was moving like, I don't know, William Blake or one Samaya. of those bonnies. <laughs> Samaya, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 
yeah, it was it was it was really good. I enjoyed it. So big up Mac on we love your uk. Go and check out go and check out all the, the writers, the website. And yeah, it's it's been a pleasure, Rob. We need yeah. a song for, for the for the audio. Obviously it won't be on YouTube because copyright and that. Oh yeah. Um has to be something sad, doesn't it? We played the angel. Um Oh, oh that's so game. sad. Because we that's... were trying to hype everything up, but yeah. Uh, maybe the song that you, uh, you chuck on your, um, on your, on well, your I don't Instagram. Want to be alive. Yeah. It does feel fitting. It does. Yeah. Logic yeah. song, yeah. which is some, uh, the suicide helpline <laughs> number in America. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we'll play that. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure, Rob. And yeah. hopefully I'll sp- we'll speak to each other with maybe one other, um, or whoever's available after the Everton game um, absolutely right I need to go to the library <laughs> <Yeah>. nice <laughs> right <laughs> see you later see you bye. later bye bye